Welcome to Module 7, Metadata and Sharing. You just learned about digital photography and heard the word metadata. Now we will delve into that term and help you record information about your photographs and share them with your family, friends, and the public. So, oh, what is metadata? Meta is a Greek word or prefix meaning something that transcends or something that is self-referential. Perhaps you've all heard the term metaphysics or more recently metaverse. Metaphysics is a philosophy that attempts to explain the things that physics cannot, things that at least to our current understanding transcend physics. The metaverse is a virtual universe only accessible in the digital realm, a virtual universe within our own physical universe, so to speak. The same principle applies to metadata, which is defined as information about information. As we discuss photography, the information we have at our disposal is the photograph itself. Therefore, the metadata for a photograph describe that image. Metadata are the who, what, when, and where we glean from the image. There are all types of metadata archivists are used to recording. The most common are who or what is pictured, where was the photograph taken, when was the photograph taken, who took the picture, and what is going on. In the past, your ancestors likely wrote directly on the photographs themselves. In one sense, this is very helpful because had they not written anything down, you today might not know whose portrait you're holding. On the other hand, writing on a photograph damages the image, which is something we certainly want to avoid. You can see here that writing in ink on the reverse of a photograph can either bleed through to the front of the image, or if the writer pressed down hard enough, the pen marks can cause indentations that affect the image on the front as pictured here. There are several solutions available today that can save your photographs from ink damage. First, instead of writing directly on a photograph, we can put our housing skills to use and place each photograph in an individually labeled sleeve. When you label the sleeve, be sure to do so in pencil and write on the envelope before you put the photograph inside. This method is the best way to store your photographs and retain the metadata. However, it is very time intensive. On the flip side, it reduces ease of access if you do not have an index, which we will talk about soon. If you do not have the resources or patience to use archival envelopes and boxes for your photographs, the next best option may be to use photograph albums. Choose an album that lets you insert the pictures into sleeves and one that has pages on which you can write. This way, your pictures are visible and you can clearly describe the metadata on the pages without damaging the photographs. Never use a magnetic or sticky album. After you organize all your photographs, how does one find a particular image? The first step is labeling your storage material. If you're using boxes, try box one, box two, box three, etc. Then within each box, number every folder like you see here using the box number, in this case one, slash folder number. This has a double benefit of helping you place the folder back into the correct box and number order after you take it out. If your photographs are stored in albums, consider calling the albums album one, album two, etc. Then number each page inside. Now you have a reference point for every photograph to which you can tie your metadata. This is where the metadata comes in handy because you will use it to create an index to your collection. We highly recommend an electronic index because one, it can be searched by keyword, two, it is easy to update, and three, it is easy to share and back up. The most common electronic index form is a spreadsheet. Microsoft Excel works on Windows computers and the Mac product numbers for Apple. We will focus on Excel for this presentation. A, a spreadsheet is laid out in columns and rows. Each column should be labeled with a specific metadata field. Here is an example. The location column is intended for the location of a physical photograph. Is it an album, a box, on the wall? Let's say our first photograph is in box one, folder one. The description column is for you to describe what you see in the photo, who or what is there, and if something is happening. 
our example photograph shows a young boy with two fish. We know this is Bernard Clark Gill and that he is five years old. Therefore, we may want to type something like, five-year-old Bernard Clark Gill poses with two fish, or maybe simply, Bernard, five, poses with two fish. We could get more detailed and say we think he's wearing linen clothes, there's a straw hat on the ground next to his feet, and that the fish are largemouth bass. It's up to you how detailed you want to get. The keywords column is for exactly that. We recommend you enter words that you typically use in doing an internet search. For example, this might be fish, fishing, bass, largemouth bass. For people in the photo, you may want to use full names and or nicknames and include the dates of birth. Gill, Bernard Clark, 1906 to 1996. Bernie, Uncle Bernard, etc. If it helps, create a separate column for people. The date is self-explanatory. If you don't know the date, consider entering your best guess. If you can't even guess a decade, feel free to leave this field blank or say unknown or no date. Coverage means where the photograph was taken. In this case, we know it is Dent County. It's up to you how specific you wanna get. Some people may prefer simply Dent County. Others like Dent County, Missouri, and we can take it even one step further and input Dent County, Missouri, United States. The photographer is also straightforward. Format shouldn't really matter as long as you are consistent. You could enter Charles Elliot Gill or Gill, comma, Charles Elliot, or even Gill, comma, Charles Elliot, 1869 to 1962. If you do not know who took the photo, simply put unknown or leave it blank. The format column may not be as important for some families, but here's where you can record the size and type of your photograph. This is where you get to deploy your newly acquired photograph identification skills. Ours is a 5 by 7 black and white copy print, which incidentally was made from a glass plate negative. We can be specific and say 5 by 7 black and white modern 2010 copy print made from a scan of a glass plate negative, or we could say 5 by 7 black and white print, or simply black and white print. It's up to you and whatever you feel comfortable with. For something out of the ordinary, like a tintype or a daguerreotype, we do recommend that you record that level of specificity here because those objects come with their own storage and handling needs. Most people, however, have print photograph collections and are content with inputting black and white print, color print, color Polaroid, or even just print in this field. Again, it's all up to your preferences. Finally, the notes field is a catch-all for anything else you may want to remember about this item. For us, we could say original glass plate stored separately. For you, it may be something along the lines of this was grandpa's favorite vacation spot or this is the only surviving photograph of great grandpa. You could also state such facts as upper corners of original glass plate are broken off. Really, it's just a great place for personalization. As we mentioned in the previous module, metadata for digital photographs can be part of the digital file itself, like what you see here. It's still a good idea to create an index for your digital photos too. Everything is pretty much the same as for analog formats, except in the location column, you should put the file name and in the format field, you may put the resolution and or file type. The great thing about electronic indexes is that they are searchable. We will show you a completed one from one of our collections. So this is the spreadsheet that we use at the Missouri State Archives for the Mark Schreiber collection. It's a collection that has images from multiple different correctional institutions across the Missouri. As you can see down here, we have a tab for each institution. And the one we're doing right now is the Missouri State Penitentiary. Um, so you can see that this spreadsheet is 2,045 lines long just for this one institution. And that begs the question, how do you find one particular photograph among over 2,000? Um, the short answer is you can do a keyword search and it can hit control 
F on your keyboard, or you can go to the upper right here and hit this find button. Um, we're going to be looking for a specific person whose name is Eidson, and all we have to do is click find next right here. And it takes us to the first hit in our spreadsheet on line 31. Let's wrap, unwrap the text, or wrap the text, so that we can see what uh, is said exactly on this line. And in the description field, you'll see that there's a description of what's happening in the photograph. We have two different subject columns here. The first one is from the Library of Congress, and they set specific vocabulary, what's called controlled vocabulary, that is um, the same across institutions across the U.S. And then we use a second column over here for our local subject keywords in which we can put anything we want. We've put um, nicknames for the Missouri State Penitentiary, and we've also inserted the full names and dates of birth and death for the individuals in the photograph. We've got a column over here for the facility, um, the coverage, which again is the location of where the photograph was taken, date of the photograph, the dimensions, um, in other words, the format of the photograph. We have the photographer's name and we have rights information in this column. So you can see there's many more columns here that we use internally than what we would recommend normally just for a person working on his or her own personal photograph collection. Um, and then finally on the left here we have uh, a box number and a folder number that we can use to pull the original photograph or if we prefer to look at the digital scan this gives us the image name um, the exact file name for the photograph that we're looking for Electronic spreadsheets are beneficial too when you want to share the descriptions of your photograph collection with someone else. All you have to do is send them the file. Then that person can pick and choose which photograph or photographs he or she would like to see and not waste time looking through images that are not of interest. Then you will be able to pull those specific photographs or digital scans and show them to your friend. Easy, right? We hope so. Let's jump back a little and pretend that there are metadata you don't know because this will happen. In the second half of this module, we will take some time to give you tips for figuring out the missing metadata on your own. For example, what if you have a photograph that you know certain things about but not the date? Date is the most common piece of missing metadata. For determining date, we suggest using context clues. Look closely at this postcard of a dining room inside Arrowhead Lodge at Lake of the Ozarks. The text on the postcard does not provide a date. What can we look at here to give us an idea? Well, the clothing the people are wearing may be one clue, but it would be rather broad in this case. Fortunately, there is a newspaper rack in the bottom left corner. If we blow it up, we can get a better look at its contents. Alas, we cannot read the date of the paper. However, we can make out the headline. This issue of the St. Louis Star Times has a front page story headlined, US using blackjack, Lewis says. Now, if you know what blackjack was and who Lewis was, you're lucky. For those of us who don't, we will turn to an online newspaper database. We searched for US using blackjack and got several results. Here is a screen capture of the first four. The St. Louis Star Times is not among them, but this was a major story and appeared in headlines across the nation. All four of these front page stories were printed on March 6th or 7, 1947. Now we have a very good estimate of when the Arrowhead Lodge photograph was taken. Another common method of dating photographs from context clues uses vehicles. Let's look at this undated image of the Folded Hills dining room in Osage Beach. First off, any car aficionado could probably identify the make, model, and year of these cars parked out front. Barring that particular skill, let's zoom in on the nearest license plate. Fortunately, the plate is legible right down to the year in the upper right corner. 1953. This plate expires in March, but check out the trees in the background. Because they are full and leafy, this photograph was likely not taken in March. 
Maybe it was the summer before in 1952, or maybe the driver's plates are expired and it was summer 1953. Because we cannot be 100% certain like in our previous photo, we will have to say this photo was likely taken circa or around 1953. Other context clues for determining dates are, as we just mentioned, vehicle makes and models, buildings presence, clothing attire, US flags, which changed design multiple times as illustrated here, and of course the format and type of the photograph itself. If there is a child in the photo and you know who that child is, that's another great clue because you can estimate the child's age, then compare with his or her birth date and narrow the photograph's date down to a few years that way. At the very least, you have an earliest possible year because you know the photograph could not have been taken before the child was born. Speaking of when buildings were built, let's take a look at this postcard. This is a good lesson in human error. The sender wrote down the date, Jan 28, 1911, at the top of the card. However, when we look at the postmark, even though part of the year is missing, there's just enough of a suggestion there to hint that the year does not end in a one. The character is curved, not straight. In fact, it looks like a two or maybe even a three. Because the month is January in both dates, it is reasonable to theorize that the sender forgot that he was in a new year and was used to writing 1911 instead of 1912. To verify this, let's look at the front of the card. Here we see the sender, Mr. Power, standing on the Osage River at Lynn Creek below a suspension bridge. We know from other sources that this bridge was not completed until late 1911. Therefore, the date probably could not be January 1911. Even though we can only see part of the bridge, it does look complete from this end. If that doesn't satisfy you, let's put the nail in the coffin for sealing the sender's error. Leonard Power offers another tantalizing clue when he states that the school superintendent died at Christmas. We checked 1910 and 1911 death certificates for Camden County, which is where Lynn Creek is located, but did not find anything to corroborate this. Next, we went to the 1910 federal census rolls and looked for people in Camden County with the occupation superintendent. We got one result, Green B. Davis. Next, we went back to the death certificate search and widened it to every county and found that Green B. Davis died in St. Louis on Christmas Day, 1911. Most certainly now, Mr. Per Power erred in recording 1911 as the year for his postcard when it should have been 1912. All humans make errors, so keep an eye out for contradictory information in any form, visual, numerical, or otherwise, when recording your metadata. Perhaps you can rectify a century-old mistake like this one. This postcard is a great example of what you can enter in the notes field in your metadata spreadsheet. Now, let's use our detective skills with format identification and helping to narrow down when a photograph might have been taken. First off, it is very important to know that format can only give an estimate of data creation. There are always outliers and there are also modern photographers who like to use antiquated photographic processes. Nonetheless, a photograph's format can probably give you a rounded figure for date of creation. Let's look at this cyanotype from our collections. The very fact that it is a cyanotype gives us the popular use dates of the 1840s and 1870s through 1920s. It probably wasn't the 1840s, since there are very few survivors from that decade, especially for Missouri. In fact, we know of no surviving 1840s Missouri cyanotypes. Again, though, this is just an educated guess. This leaves us with the 1870s through 1920s. 60 years is a long time. We can estimate a time of year because most of the trees are leafless, meaning fall through early spring. But for the actual year or even a decade, we would need clothing experts and or architectural experts to look at the attire and the home. Sometimes it just isn't possible to narrow a date down. Disappointment is something all researchers must deal with. In this example, we can leave the date field as 1870s through 1920s, or simply put no date or unknown.
Metadata in Board Digital Photographs can be tricky because it can change. Every time you copy a file, or especially when you edit a file, the metadata for that file is modified. This photograph started life as a JPEG. When we right click and select properties, we can see the date February 5, 2021 in the modified and accessed fields. But the created date reads December 12, 2022. How can that be? That's nearly two years after the photograph was taken. So how could it possibly have been created in 2022? The answer is it wasn't. What happened was the file was moved from its original folder to a new folder on December 12, 2022. The computer then overwrote the create date with the date the file was moved, thus falsifying the date the file was actually created in the camera. Now, was this photograph taken on February 5, 2021, as the modified and access fields imply? There are a couple ways to find out. The quickest is to select the Details tab under the same Properties window. Under Origin, there is a Date Taken field. This tells us the photograph of the building was taken February 1st, not the 5th. So there is yet another date-related metadata field for electronic photographs. Other methods are checking the weather for that day, checking social media to see if the photo was posted on a specific day, or using other context clues. What's worse than moving a file from one folder to another is when a user changes the file format. When this happens, all the existing dates are wiped out and replaced with that day's date. We see in our example that we converted the building 01 JPEG to a .tiff file on December 12, 2022. Now, all three dates read 2022 and the original date of creation, February 1, 2021, is completely erased. Someone coming across the TIFF file would probably never know that the original photograph was taken in 2021. The computer thinks that the photo was taken in 2022, and technically the TIFF was created then. But for a human being interested in when the actual image was captured in real life, that information is no longer part of the file. Thus, be warned that not all electronic metadata are as they seem. How can one determine if electronic metadata have been replaced? Well, we will go back to context clues. Currently, there are very few, if any, cell phone cameras or other digital cameras that take photographs in TIFF format. Therefore, if you have a TIFF image in your collection, you can safely assume that it is a second generation image and that the date fields no longer necessarily reflect the original metadata. The trickiest format for dates and whether or not they have been changed lies with the JPEG. Almost all digital cameras take JPEGs by default. If you have a JPEG and you are unsure whether to trust the electronic metadata regarding the date, try looking for clues in the image content. If the image shows trees full of green leaves and the metadata say the photo was created and modified in February, chances are that February date is not an original date. If all three date fields are different, chances are that file was modified at some point. Finally, if you have a set of digital photographs that were obviously taken at the same place on the same day, look at the metadata for every image and see if and where the date data match. Because of the ease of digital photography, most people will take more than one photo at a time. If relatives send you an image you know to have modified metadata, try asking them to either send you a sample of other photos from that shoot or asking them to look at the metadata themselves and seeing if they can help you out. To mitigate this electronic metadata conundrum for future researchers, after you verify a create date for a digital image, write that date down. Write it into the file name as seen in the image on the left. Write it into the description field of the file as in the center image. Most certainly, write it into the metadata index you use. Feel free to add a note in the notes field stating how you came to the proper conclusion. Your relatives and researchers will thank you. Finally, be sure to back up your work. This is very, very important. Most photographs have only one copy, and that is the original. To save your unique collection from this danger of loss, consider digitizing all your photographs and distributing copies of those digital scans to those who express interest. If that is too much work, make backups of just a sampling of those photos. 
those you consider the most precious or the most unique. Your photos are safer against loss if more than one person retains a copy. It is also important to store your materials in more than one place. Institutions have an easier time of this, especially with digital images, because one copy could be stored on a server where the institution is and another backed up off-site. Members of the public may want to put copies of digital photos or the originals of most value in a fireproof safe inside their home, in addition to having a ready to access copy elsewhere in the home and even a third copy off site with a relative. Becoming proficient with metadata takes practice. In time, you will come to appreciate the process, especially if you are a person who likes organizing and solving mysteries. Once you have processed your collection, that is, housed it properly, stored it properly, and recorded the information to the best of your ability, it is time to share it with your audience. Your collection will be the envy of genealogists and researchers. This was the last module of our seven module series. If you have watched all of them, you are now able to identify your photographs by process, house the photos properly, You've learned to store them properly, dealt with any conservation issues that may have arisen, learned the ins and outs of color photography and digital photography, and finally recorded your metadata. We hope these lessons have been beneficial. You may contact the Missouri State Archives anytime at the addresses and number below. Thank you for listening.